Welcome to the No Plateau Podcast. For stroke and brain injury survivors, their caregivers, and the therapists helping them to break boundaries in their recovery journey. Hosted by Henry Hoffman, occupational and clinical therapist, this podcast is intended to supplement stroke and brain injury survivors' recovery journey. Therefore, all content affiliated with this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. And now, here's Henry Hoffman. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the No Plateau podcast. I am your host, Henry Hoffman, and I am excited to be with you today. Today is going to be a really fun topic that I know many therapists want to hear about. It's on creating a stroke shoulder subluxation program, prim- primarily through ESTEM in the acute and subacute setting as a way to mitigate some of those uh, stroke effects. I've had this conversation for over 20 years with clinicians worldwide. And yet it seems that most uh, facilities are not preemptively addressing this issue. Look, we know that subluxation can start in the flaccid arm in as little as three weeks. Uh, So why not proactively address the problem immediately instead of waiting for subluxation to kick in down the road? Why pass the buck to outpatient when you have the opportunity to attack it now? So when I used to do these SABO classes in the U.S. and overseas, I would ask therapists um, a couple of questions. I'd say, raise your hands if you feel subluxation is a problem at your facility. Then I would say, keep your hands up if you feel ESTEM may help minimize or reduce the effects of subluxation. So all the hands would go up. Then I'd say, keep your hands up if you have a subluxation program for your new admits uh, that qualify. All the hands would go down. Literally, all of them would go down. Most common reasons were everything from cost. ESTEM units were, you know, not not cheap. They were complicated, a lot of wires. Electrode placement was iffy between clinicians and nursing. Uh, Training with nursing was another factor, or just clinical staff. And of course, Not all OTs specifically are comfortable with this modality. So for a host of reasons, these programs were not offered. Which brings me to my special guest today, who has successfully created a subluxation program at her facility. Please welcome Jenna Barber to the podcast. Jenna is currently an occupational therapist at Freydert. I had to learn a couple times how to pronounce Freydert. If you look at the spelling, it's not like it sounds. It's in Wisconsin. She graduated with a bachelor's degree in kinesiology from the University of Wisconsin and then went on to work as a National Academy of Sports Medicine certified personal trainer for two years. Soon after, she obtained her master's degree in OT from Concordia University and is currently a full-time employee at Freighter, practicing in both the acute and outpatient departments with special emphasis on the neuro and orthopedic conditions. Wow. Welcome, Jenna. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I don't even well, think I necessarily have to introduce myself. You did such a good job. <laughs> yes. Well, we're, I'm very excited to have you today because I know it's a hot topic. But before we dive in, just with the audience, I'm sure I didn't cover everything. Mm-hmm. But if you could just share a little bit more about your professional and personal background, that would be oh, great. Oh, most definitely. Um, so I have been an OT for over seven years now. I'm really starting out um, always with Freighter and then dabbled a little bit in home health, which hasn't been that much to, I guess, kind of talk about. But I am primarily in neuroacute, um, and the last few years, I really kind of wanted to go off and specialize in outpatient, not just neuro, but also orthopedic, which um, I think has really improved my ability to treat neuro, knowing kind of the orthopedic side. So I, I love what I do at the moment. I split my week between working at the hospital in neuroacute for two days, and then I come over to outpatient and, and do outpatient for two days. So it's a nice mix for me. Yeah, I love that because it's also a continuity of care conundrum in this world, right? So you're kind of addressing both sides. So you know the issues and concerns that the acute patients are going through, and then you know the issues and concerns that's going to happen in outpatient. And you can then affect change knowing the problems. That's awesome. I think a lot of therapists should have that as part of the plan, you know, have them do outpatient, have them do acute, and then we can kind of close the loops. That's that's great. I was trying to remember, I'm glad we're doing this topic. I know we've been talking about this topic for a while. We'll, we'll dive into why we're doing this topic, but I was trying to remember the uh, how we first met and how that conversation popped up about trialing a subluxation program at your facility. What do you recall? Yeah. Well, <clears throat> So I, I was getting the program started and I reached out to um, Bianca Sable Rep and I was asking if you guys had any handouts that I could use to give to the patients. And I specifically kind of at that time um, wanted to include placements that were most popular and it brought you on board because you're very passionate about the placements for subluxation. So it kind of opened my eyes to maybe better placements. Um, so that's how we got, got you on. 
That's right. Now, now I remember that. And we'll, and I'm going to explain electrode placements in a second for the group because we do get students, we do get patients, but a lot of therapists and some might not be neuro nerds, if you will, that know the latest. So I'll, I'll quickly view, uh, review some of the electrode placements. But you're right. That was now that now this is uh, coming full circle. I remember this conversation. And then once I provided the information on some of the research behind electrode placement options, I think we started then both discussing the frustrations of not having a really good proactive addressable protocol with with a slash program that we can immediately provide to clinicians and patients right when they're admitted to the hospital. Is that right? Yeah, I remember you were. Um impressed, you know, you're like, I need to learn more because you guys might be one of the few acute hospitals who are actually doing an Easton program on their patients. And so um, we wanted more people to start doing it. So here we are. Yeah, well, way to go. Way to go. Well, let's dive in. But before we dive into your specific program and what we've learned and, you know, questions like, uh, how do you set one up to uh, what were the hurdles to uh, lessons learned, billing, productivity? We got lots of questions. Before we get into all that, let me just take a step back and uh, review subluxation a little bit. I won't bore the audience, um, but I know there's some folks that are going to be watching or listening that are still not 100% sure on the latest. So uh, let me blow off the dust of my subluxation fact sheet and just go over a few things. So subluxation, glenohumeral subluxation is present in up to 81% of the patients following stroke. I mean, if you read deeper, it's studies go from 17% to 81%, but it's literally some studies up to 81%, which is huge. It often occurs by the third week following a stroke in flaccid arms. Now, Jenna, I mean, three weeks, again, another need why we have to have this program. These patients are admitted just after a few days and their arm is floppy and flaccid. And you can imagine over a period of two, three weeks, the stretching of that capsule ligament muscles. I know we have other strategies to support the shoulder, positioning strategies, safe handling, but we're not living with the patient 24 seven. So it's gonna stretch, it's gonna hang, gravity is definitely gonna pull it, yet most facilities are not even addressing the stretching of the capsule, stretching of the muscles, the inert and non-inert structures. So it is a problem. And so after three weeks, I, you'd have to imagine even before your, your guidelines, um, you must be seeing that a ton of that um, in the hallways w- with these patients, you know, within the first couple of weeks, right? Yeah, you know, in my head, I thought that I was like, oh, we wouldn't, but actually, kind of deep dive deeping and looking back, we we do see the subluxes pretty early, and I try to get people who to prevent it, you know, in addition to just treat it. But a large majority of our patients already have a sublux in the hospital. Right, that's exactly right. Now, you know, another interesting tidbit is when for the therapist, when you think about trapezius muscles, rhomboids, and serratus anterior, when those get weak, that causes the scapula to abduct, downwardly rotate, and depress. And then, of course, these patients that are flaccid, typically their, their spine flexes laterally during that, altering the scapulothoracic relationship. Having said all that, due to the changes of the glenoid fossa position, because you're now in that downward rotation, ro- rotated position, traditionally, for many years, uh, scientists and therapists believe that the labrum can no longer provide sufficient support. There was a locking mechanism to support the head in the glenoid fossa. So if you down, downwardly rotate your scapula, they thought naturally the head of the humerus is going to go out of the glenoid labrum where that locking mechanism is and then just pull down. Research now suggests there's very little evidence of relationship between scapular rotation and subluxation, which is shocking to me, but we got to trust the science because I always thought, gee, if you really had a lot of rotation downward, that's got to affect the pull of the humerus, but it doesn't. Um, and, and, and so research uh, shows that that's, that's the case. So that does not mean ignore the scapulothoracic muscles, ignore training the serratus and the rhomboids and the traps. But however, the main emphasis should be on strengthening the proximal migrators, which we'll talk about. When I say proximal migrators, I'm referring to muscles that literally lift the humerus back up. So that's the focus, lifting the humerus back up, sustaining that position. Yeah, it's good to strengthen those uh, scapulothoracic muscles, but that should not be your primary focus. Now, with respect to subluxation and pain, for years, literature suggested that there was a direct relationship between pain and subluxation. I always thought that, I mean, when you think about dislocating a joint, Jenna, you would think it hurts, right? (laughs) So forever, you would think, gee, it hurts. But in fact, the science shows that there's not a direct relationship between subluxation and pain. What what say you about that? Uh, you know, not a lot of patients, especially acutely in the hospital, complain about 
pain with their subluxation some, but, but it, it, it doesn't correlate. I feel like. Yeah, I would agree with that. So let's switch gears and talk a little bit more about treatment. Uh, just scrolling down these notes that I have. So, and again, a lot of guidelines in many countries, uh, I'll, I'll use UK and Ireland's national stroke guidelines because that was the latest one I read. Some key things to consider. I used to be a taping guy. I used to be a sling recommender, but I got to tell you, it will not reduce your subluxation. It will not minimize your subluxation. It will not prevent subluxation. Now, slings will definitely prevent further dislocation if used properly. Taping, on the other hand, it's a thin, flimsy piece of tape on the outermost surface of your skin, okay? So your arm is 5% of your total body weight. No tape is going to reapproximate the humerus and keep it there secure. So consider uh, taping for pain. Maybe that will help. I know there's some studies on that, but don't waste your money or there's a lot of time involved in, in taping because you're not going to get the results as far as quote unquote reversing or preventing uh, subluxation. Now, other things we know from these guidelines is that e-stim and strengthening are the number one go-tos for mitigating subluxation. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Now, obviously, if the patient has volitional movement and they're not flaccid, and let's say they're three out of five muscle strength, you don't really even need to do e-stim. Just do pure strengthening, and you're going to strengthen the proximal migrators, and you're going to, over time, strengthen the cuff and get some stability there. And, and a lot of it will resolve itself. But for folks that are less than three out of five, they're going to need a little extra boost. And that's where the e-stim comes in. And we do know that that's a... Uh, uh, a very important tool. It's recommended by many, many guidelines and discussed in many studies. So um, I don't think there's too much of a debate there. I think the bigger concern is our therapist ESTEM trained and competent and comfortable. So we'll, we'll get into that. Traditional therapists also considered, you know, if you're going to do ESTEM forever, Jenna, it was, I mean, I graduated in the mid nineties, posterior deltoid supra, posterior deltoid supra, posterior deltoid supra. Okay. I'm going to listen to my supervisor because why not? I'm a new grad. And then you get it's habitual, right? And you don't question it unless you dive deep and look at some of the research. Well, over time, it turned out that posterior deltoid, of course, posterior deltoid continues to be a strong proximal migrator, and it's one of the ones you want to focus on. But supra became very questionable. And there was a lot of researchers that talk about how supra is questionable. Um, it is not a strong proximal migrator, number one. And number two, it shows that there is almost 50% of stroke patients exhibit asymptomatic partial tears of their supraspinatus tendon. So I don't know about you, but I don't know if I want to be stimming a partially torn tendon, whether even if it doesn't hurt yet. What say you? Uh, wouldn't work as good, right? <laughs> right. And it's not even a strong proximal migrator. The strongest proximal migrators were, Long had a tricep. You know, there's a study, Halder did a study where Long had a tricep um, and the deltoids and Corcobrachialis are stronger proximal migrators. And if you think about insertion and origin, if it inserts, if, let's say you're the tricep, if, it ins, if it's attached to the humerus and inserts on the infraglenoid, you contract your tricep, you extend your elbow, fire your triceps, it's going to lift the humerus. So super is more of a compressor. I'm not saying ignore it, but if you only have two electrodes, personally, I'm not putting one of them on supra. Finally, to wrap up the uh, fact sheet I have, uh, for best treatment of shoulder subluxation, electrode placements over the deltoid muscles is preferred. Che did a bunch of articles on this. They are, in fact, the strongest proximal migrators of the shoulder joint. Did I miss anything that's, again, I talked about slings, talked about taping. I was trying to go over some of the hot topics. Mm -hmm. Obviously, patient handling, positioning, sleep schedule, you know, where's the arm when you're sleeping, all that stuff's important too. Any, any other tidbits you'd want to share that you think I didn't cover? Uh, no, I, I think you hit it right on the head. It's, it's funny because all those guidelines, right? Like they tell us what to do, but for some of them, it's easier to put into practice, the safe handling, the proper positioning, even like slings, you know, but for some reason that e-stim is hard to put into like real life play. Well, that's what we're going to dive into because we're trying to make it very easy to use, right? And, and so hopefully things like the program will be a nice start to kind of get the awareness out there. So let's dive deep into that. Uh, so why did you actually develop the subluxation program? Take me through the impetus behind wanting to start this program. Oh, sure. Last year, I had the opportunity um, to teach one of a neuro rehab course at Concordia for Jessica Schmidt when she was on medical leave. And thankfully, I didn't have to do anything with the course. I just taught what she had. And she spent an entire week on shoulder subluxation and really stressed the importance of, you know, all, all the, the points of what we just talked about. 
with a huge emphasis on using e-STEM because that's the only thing that's going to really like try to fix the problem. And so it, it lit something underneath me that I'm like, oh my gosh, like literally our practice guidelines are telling us that we should be doing this. And yet us as a profession, we're not like, we're not, why not? And so I was like, we need to start this. And so I went to um, my leadership and wrote up a proposal with justification, you know, using everything in literature that supports it and asked if we could and try to do it in a way that was easy for therapists, um, easy for nursing staff, just easy for everybody that it it would be attainable. And they went for it. Um, Specifically kind of knew about a product that I wanted to use that didn't mess with wires. That was super easy to figure out. Um, So I think that played a large play on it for sure on getting the okay for the program. Um, That's, that's really cool. So, so that the first step's the biggest step, right? So then can you spend a minute then going through, so therapists are listening, therapists are in your position right now. Can we dive a little bit deeper and go through the developmental process of starting the program? We won't get into the actual protocol yet, Mm -hmm. but literally from point A to point B, point B getting approval, what are the steps that you recommend? I mean, obviously there's hurdles. What are those hurdles? Is there a budget that you had to propose? What were those challenges? But what would you recommend to the listeners today if they want to start tomorrow? What are the key things they need to do to get their administration to listen? Yeah. Gather your evidence. So literally you could Google like 2023 stroke guidelines because they just came out and it it has it right in there um, with good kind of research articles to support it. And then write up a little, like I did a Word document and I said, you know, like want to start the shoulder sublux program for yada, yada, yada. Here's the evidence behind it. Here's the product that I want to use, which um, I talked about the Sable Stim 1, which is relatively inexpensive, starting out with just two units. So it wasn't this budget breaker by any sense. Um, and and ask if we could do a soft trial on just one unit, um, so just a 30-bed unit, to do a dry run. And quite honestly, it really wasn't that hard. You just have to ask and show support. And they they said, fine, and we're able to to order two units and um, get it going. So when you put up the proposal, you sent it to your supervisor, Mm -hmm. right? And you explained the need. It was almost like a needs assessment because you backed it up by science. It's not like you're doing some crazy junk science strategy. Um, You basically told them this is going to help the patient. It's it's evidence-based. I know it's important for JCO accreditation and everything else. You got to do everything that's Mm evidence-based. And if you're not doing it, you got to wonder why you accredited because you're supposed to be doing everything that's evidence-based. So you then, the next step is you're requesting for a beta test. And how long did that beta test run? Uh, just a month until we went hospital wide. Okay. So when you went a month, you, did you collect certain data f- during that test? Or was it more feasibility well, just to was, see, try it on patients? Yeah, or- going back to therapists and nursing and, you know, what's, what's kind of going wrong? How can we tweak this um, before we kind of launch it out hospital wide? And so, so, so clearly you at least probably tracked how many patients used it, what during that beta, what were the, what, what were some of the friction points? And of course you had to do some training. So again, we'll get into the program in a second. Walk me through, who did you train? Did you train nursing or did you train therapists or both? My biggest thing is that I wanted this to be like standard of practice and easy for everybody. So truly, I try to leave nurses out of it. They already have stuff on their plate. You know, they have to be aware of the unit itself in case they need to turn it off and remove it. But as far as getting them involved with like placing it on and all of that, they're not a part of that. So the largest part of training was my therapist. And during kind of that uh, pilot program. It was the therapists who are on the floor. So we did one in service um, with maybe just five or six um, to really go through, you know, placements and the unit itself and just reviewing shoulder subluxation as a whole. Um, and then once we did hospital wide, it was another in service of all of my OTs um, who would have potential of, of seeing patients. But really the biggest thing was this one-on-one kind of training that the therapist sees a patient who would benefit from it, 
and then come to us because they haven't done it yet. And we would in that moment in time, do the training together. Um, okay. So, so you mentioned nursing did not get involved. So if some of the listeners are tied connect, you know, connected really well with nursing, what is some, what are some of the suggestions you would recommend with nursing training and therapist training oh, and, and could both exist? Could they coexist oh. or would this be a nursing program? that you train nursing to apply or would it always be a nurse and therapist working together? You know, and this is just my opinion. I, I think nurses and therapists together because, you know, we're doing assessments of the range of motion, muscle strength, subluxation grade. So I think I always want that documentation from the therapist, but by all means, if nurses want to like get it, have more involvement, that's great. I just, mine are so busy <laughs> that yeah, I yeah. want to give them a break. We do train them though, because one of the big things is, is that the Sable Stim one, it's, it's, it's little. And our fear was that we were going to lose them. <laughs> and so our big thing was, okay, if the patient has to leave the room for any imaging or procedures or anything like that, it has to be taken off of them. And so there might be some rare occasions where the nurse has to turn it off and remove. And so the nurses did need to have a little bit of training, just not as significantly as the therapists do. Got it. Okay. So great. You've answered our question regarding developing the process, um, getting approval, doing the beta test. Um, budget was not an issue because you're only talking about a couple devices and they're not expensive. Um, and then let's transition now to the actual program. So let's try it this way first. Let's pretend I'm the stroke survivor and I'm a new admission to your facility. And, and this is just a typical day now at Freighter under the subluxation program. Walk me through what happens day one, new admit with this program. Sure. Yeah. Um, so we probably see you maybe day one after somebody had a stroke. And at, at that time, we evaluate if you would benefit from it. So regardless, if you currently have a shoulder sublux, or hopefully you don't yet, um, we get you started on the program because we want to prevent one from happening at all. So let's say day one, maybe day two, if eval is pretty hefty and takes a long time, we get it started. Um, the first one to two sessions, we have the eSTEM running dur our, during our OT session itself so we can establish some tolerance. Um, but after that, once we know that the eSTEM's fine, patient's comfortable, we see them for our regular sessions after, say, day two. And we then put the eSTEM at the end of our session and leave it on them when we leave. So they have a solid 60 minutes of eSTEM unattended. We'll come back, take it off, you know, bring it back to the gym for charging. But it's a 60-minute treatment session where we come up with 60. I mean, we can go back to research that's showing that 60 minutes um, has, you know, improvement. But also that the Sable one, it automatically shuts off after 60 minutes, which is very helpful for us because then we don't have to, like, run back saying, like, oh, my gosh, they've had it for longer um, so it, it automatically shut off after 60. We do it Monday through Friday. And truly that's just because we have a higher staff ratio, um, during the week than the weekend. Again, easeability, um, for our, for our therapy team. And they wear it then once they started, they wear it for the entire duration of their hospital stay. And we have this program running, um, at Freighter Blue Mound Rehabilitation Hospital. So our IPR so then they keep going through the weeks that they're in inpatient rehab too, and then on once they're home. So it's, we get to have them on it for a long time, which is good. Wow. I'm kind of excited now actually <laughs> to be a patient. Not that I ever want to be a patient, um, but it seems like you're really taking care of me. So, okay, let's start back. Uh, I get admitted. When am I not a candidate? You mentioned, obviously, if I have movement, uh, enough movement, I wouldn't need it. But what are some other examples of patients who are definitely not a candidate for the subluxation program? Yeah. You know, we can go over, there's contraindications with electrical stem. Um, so we can go through those. So anybody who has contraindications, which would be, you know, systemic cancer. So cancer kind of all over the body. We don't want it the risk of it spreading. You know, if anybody has like metal implantations, um, we don't want to put e-stim over that. What other ones here? I'm blanking. So, so yeah, so I was, uh, sorry for not clarifying, ones that you've already had during your beta testing. Cool. Yes. And, and, and by the way, therapists will have, when you, when you have a manual open for any e-stim device, 
you're going to see about 4,700 pages of contraindications. I always love the one where it says, you know, don't go swimming with your ESTEM device or some crazy stuff like that. Pacemakers is a very common one. Usually, and, and to be honest with you, it, more so in Europe um, um, and then in the United States, they're actually questioning some of the contraindications. They're questioning the implant ones now. Um, obviously, directly over metal is not a good idea, but if it's you know not too close, um, there's a whole group of experts that now feel that that's not really a contraindication. By the way, everything I'm saying here doesn't mean go ahead and do it. This is this is just me having a conversation, so don't hold me liable. But I've also heard that if you have cancer, it depends where. And sometimes you have chemotherapy side effects that lead to tingling, nerve issues that you can use for sensory stem. So of course, if you have a tumor over your area you want to focus on, that's not going to be recommended. And I know there's some doctors who won't recommend it if you had brain tumor. So you got to go back to your doctor, get approval. Don't listen to us. Uh, get approval from your doctor or read the manual. But yeah, those seem to be the hot ones. You mentioned dosage. So it's 60 minutes. Is it once a day I was, or twice a day? I was trying to confirm mm -hmm. that. We do it once a day. Um, ideally, I try to tell my therapist, you know, like once they're established, maybe throw it on the beginning of their session and then restart it. So we get a little bit more because we, we know more is better, but it's just once a day usually. Okay. And after they're comfortable, they know what they're doing. The therapist goes down the hall, turns it on, puts it yep. on. Now, do you ever just educate the patient and maybe the families there? Because, you know, when you look at the SaboStim one, for the people who are listening to the audio version of this, you're not seeing the SaboStim one. But if you're watching the video podcast, it is small and it wraps right around the shoulder. Maybe you can just show how it just go around. So any patient or family member can do that. And, and what we were trying to do when we created that product was, um, you know, one button, one program, anyone can do it type of strategy to get rid of all the impediments of why people don't do Easton. Uh, or create a program. So have you had scenarios where you're just telling the husband, the wife, or the patient, just put this on, I'm not going to come and just uh, turn it on? Or do you always show up to do it? Yeah, uh, well, if it's our units, we'll show up to do it. There has been occasions where the patients early on will buy it right away. That's a little bit rare because we are just acutely in the hospital still. I think it's more prevalent in our inpatient rehab. But once, you know, Sometimes the patients and family members will buy their own units and then they, you know, will do it even without us anymore. Okay. Okay. So um, once they use it, you then come back, it automatically turns off. You said, so you come back and you pick it up. So you're eliminating one of the other big issues, which is patients magically or your devices magically uh, becoming lost, quote unquote, right? So by you controlling the product, you're controlling when you give it to them, when you take it back, these aren't magically going home with patients. Yeah. Is that, that the whole goal? We there? have not lost one. <laughs> also, <laughs> we have these laminated signs that we put outside of their room, kind of where our isolation signs are to alert like everybody that the patient's wearing this product, watch out, they can't wear it if they move you know, are removed from the room. So I think that has helped too, just this awareness, like, hey, the product's in the patient's room, yeah. Um, but we haven't lost one, so it's it's been awesome. What percentage? So let's say you are how many? Let me put it. Let me ask this mm -hmm. way: How many stroke beds do you have at the at the acute hospital that you're at? If you have monthly admits, oh, well, how many you are asked stroke? me this last Any time? I had a bad answer to this. Uh, I mean, we have make it up. <laughs> we have two solid kind of neuro units, and they're both about thirty beds each. Um, you know, we have a really strong neurosurgery program, so we get a lot of brain mass resections, but maybe let's go like 25 to 50%. Okay. So how many beds is that total? You think? Uh, how many? Oh, well, then we didn't include our neuro ICU. Okay. Let's go 80. 80 beds that are, so 80, so you may get 80 beds full of stroke patients. Well, of neuro patients, let's say. Okay. Let's, let, let's do just to keep it a simple math. How many do you think are stroke? Like a, a quarter of those? Yeah, half quarter. of those? Okay. So let's say 20 beds are stroke patients. Out of the 20, how many do you think would qualify for the subluxation program? Oh, gosh. Probably over half. Because you know, okay. we, we want to get them when they have shoulder weakness. So if they can't so if you, you know, over their head, we want to get them on. So 10. 10 would be actively potentially on the program. Mm -hmm. Minimum. A question that will definitely pop up is how many Eastam units do you need to manage 10? 
Now, remember, there's small hospitals, and then there's large hospitals. Are you considered middle of the road, or would you be considered a large neuro? Um, I think we're large neuro. We're a level one trauma center. I, overall, I think we have over 750 beds. So I would say we're the, so the largest, big. you know, in our area. Okay. So if you're the if you're one of the largest and you're only talking 10, maybe 10 stroke when you again, subluxation is not just stroke, when you're talking 10 stroke survivors, um, that's really manageable. So even if you had your two units, do you think you could with scheduling? Would you need a couple more? Because one of the things that will ultimately have to be done, regardless of the ESTIM unit you choose, doesn't have to be SABO, it could be any ESTIM unit you choose, you're gonna have to figure out how many you're gonna need. And that could be done through your beta test. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, is two good for a large system? Or if it, perfect world and you had all the funds, what would you recommend? Yeah. Well, we currently have four now, and I feel like we still oh, okay. have a wait list and we could get more people on. So maybe like maybe five, six. We also, and this is just makes it easy and kind of working out some of the kinks we have. And this is talking about the Sable One unit. So obviously it can be different if you use a different product, but each patient has their own wing, like while they're in the hospital, because the gel pads kind of stick to it and it's really hard to take the gel pad off. So when the patient's in the hospital, they have this wing themselves. Now you can take off the battery and kind of intersperse them, but that could get a little complicated. Be like, hey, you've got a battery, I need to use it. So we try to eliminate at, if you have four units, it's four patients going at one time. Um, so for us, I would love to get maybe like two more units, um, just so then we don't have anybody on a wait list. Right. Yeah. I could see that could be a problem. Well, that was the goal. Try to make it as cheap as possible and as easy as possible. So you can do those things. So hopefully your upper management understands the importance of that. Uh, before I dive into other questions, let me see what else I had on this list here. Um, how many patients at one time do you currently have on the program mm -hmm. when you did that beta testing? Yeah. What was the most you had? At um, one time? Because we had two units, we had two going, and then we had a wait list. So then our okay. pilot program. So, yeah, because you didn't have, because technically you could have two units and like 12 wings. Right, right. And alternate the wings with the units. But still, you can only do two at a time. So I could see that could be a potential issue. Mm -hmm. And then we talked about nursing. Um, and then for the acute uh, department, how long typically are they staying with you? Yeah, good question. You know, it depends on their medical stability. We have because we're the level one trauma, we get a lot of patients who come in from outside hospitals. So they're very medically complex. So I want to say our length of stay is maybe a little bit more skewed, um, but anywhere from a few days to a week and then upwards of maybe a couple weeks, especially if we're working on discharge disposition with different rehab facilities. Okay. So we know continuity, continuity of care is huge. You've attacked problem number one, which is, which is preemptive attack, which is we know subluxation is going to happen. We already know it. The guy's flaccid. You decided to, you know, make a meaningful difference right there and, and address it. They leave you with premium best practices. How many of those patients are actually going to be going to your facility, which, which they can actually continue this best practice versus getting lost in the system? Yeah, goodness. I hope a lot. And I think it is a, a higher percentage um, because we hit the ball running with, with our neuro patients, especially stroke patients. We know that best practice tells us they need to have intensive three hours of therapy a day. So we're really, that is our goal to bring them over to our inpatient rehab. Um, so I would say anywhere from upwards, you know, 75, maybe 50, it, it depends on if they can tolerate the, the three hours. But regardless of where they're discharging, even if they're not going to us, we're going to have them on the program. I just might educate a little bit more to family to be like, hey, tell your therapist to do this. Yeah, that. so that's where I was going. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, most hospitals, not all patients are going to stay within the system. So in order to be successful, it's not what you do the first week you're with them, which is the program. It's what happens next, and, you know, for some of this, right? It's what happens next. Because just like robotics, just like any other fancy program, if you only do it for a couple of weeks, why even do it? So what can we do or what have you done or what do you suggest therapists do that start a program where there's a good handoff, not only for folks that go to your inpatient and what does that look like, but what's the communication, the handoff, the recommendation for folks that go 
you don't even know where they're going. They're just not going to your inpatient. Mm -hmm. So what can, what can you share with that? Yeah. I, I think the most important thing is the educating to family and the patient because they're the biggest advocates themselves, you know, to, to make sure that they know about it, the importance and to stress it to at their next facility. Like, can we get this going? How can we get this going? Cause they're going to be the ones who want to advocate. We have handouts. I mean, if they're going to a different rehab facility, we fax, you know, our therapy notes. And so it's, it's in there, but that family and patient component to advocate for themselves, I think is going to be our best bet. We're working- oh, wait, I got an idea, what? Jenna. I got an idea. Why don't we hire a tattoo artist to come in and tattoo stim me over their deltoids? So when the next therapist sees them, or why don't you write, or is there stickers, maybe with freighter logo, where it can say, I need stim, please help and wrap it around their shoulder? What about that? I've done post-its, like on their family hand. I'll be like, you know, rehab therapist, do this. And call me and I'll like write our number down because I mean, I just want to help and I want our patients better. So like, by all means, call us, we'll help you. Yes, I know, I know. I wish, I wish, I mean, gosh, that's the goal, right? Okay, the easier path is they transition right into Freighter's system. So when they transition right into Freighter's system, how are you communicating with subacute therapists? Mm-hmm. Um, our ther- the inpatient rehab therapists know to look back on our note, and we have a couple places in our note that says that they're on the program, um, as well as you know, in each note, it carries over the the program itself, um, the amount of intensity that they need, how long that they do it, yada yada yada, and so it's right there in there, uh, and then. We, we use WebEx is kind of our instant messaging. So we can even kind of message the therapist, giving a heads up to. So do you envision doing in-services for the subacute team and, and give them the same training you provided to your acute therapist? Are you talking about our so inpatient rehab? Inpatient rehab, Oh, right. yeah. Oh, already done. So, I, so okay. when they started maybe two months after we did our pilot program and we did the same kind of training. So I went over there, I appointed a lead person to kind of run it after I, you know, did the initial, um, but it, we did kind of the same format and it worked well. Okay. And again, I think we're, we're going to dive into billing and productivity and lessons learned in a second, but I think the the main takeaway at this point is as clinicians, we need to provide evidence-based practice. As OTs, we want to provide not only evidence-based practice, but treatment that's relative to the scope of the OT practice, right? And so why are we doing what we're doing? Okay, of course, we're trying to strengthen a joint, uh, the muscle surrounding the joint. Of course, we're trying to put, prevent, minimize, mitigate, reduce, call it what you want, improve the outcome of someone who has subluxation or will have subluxation for obvious reasons. Dressing, bathing, grooming, function, okay? Uh, Walking, you need to have um, your arms swinging naturally, okay? There's a lot of reasons why we're doing what we're doing. Um, and this is all tied into our ultimate goal, which is to improve their functional life. And, and this is very outcome oriented, right? So it's important to remember this is not going to be fixed in two weeks. This is going to take months like any other treatment intervention. I don't care if you're talking about um, neuroplasticity-based treatment interventions, uh, task-specific training, constraint-induced, repetition. All those things take months. We got to get massive amount of repetitions, right? So we cannot mentally practice our way out of subluxation. We can't mirror box our way out of subluxation, right? There's no research to say, if you do 30 minutes of mirror box and mental practice training, your subluxation gets reduced. This is a different beast. This is, re- this is going to require a ton of strengthening. And that can be volitional, volitionally. And it also can be boosted with ESTIM if you can't do it volitionally. Of course, we have to do position and, and prevent further dislocation. And some patients, if you cannot get them, when you think about your stages of Bernstrom recovery, if you can't get them through those stages where they can volitionally fire their own muscles, it's going to be hard to minimize and reduce and prevent and subluxation. It just is. But if we can get them to the point where they have uh, activation proximally, we have a chance. We have hope. So what we're trying to do is make it a little easier for them to be successful. Us ignoring the problem, us doing what we've been doing for the last five decades and more, which is, yeah, subluxation, hand it over to outpatient and they'll figure it out after it's a two inch gap. That is not the answer. That's making matters worse. So the whole point of this uh, effort and what Jen is doing, which I commend her and her team immensely, is trying to make a difference. And even if we can improve the patient's outcome by 10%, it is well worth 
making the difference. And research is telling us to do this. It's not like we're, it's another you know, theory that we learned 30 years ago. So that's just kind of resummarizing why we're doing what we're doing. Um, what a perfect transition. Now that we talk about the importance, let's talk about billing and why uh, our hospitals might uh, make us a little nervous with what best practices are, but maybe not a freighter. So walk, walk us through, because this part I don't know too much about, is great. Good job. Congratulations, Jenna. You've proven that you're an awesome clinician and you know what you need to do to make patients' life a little bit better. How are we going to make the accounting department at the hospital's life a little bit better as well? So tell us, how does it work with billing? Did billing change at all? Did productivity change at all? Are you losing money for freighter or are you going to keep your job or not? <laughs> I'm here to stay. <laughs> Okay. Uh, you know, that's one of the kind of maybe excuses that why they don't have something like this Easton because gosh, it's just one more thing that we have to do that we're not getting kind of any reward for one more thing added, but we do bill for it. Um, we use the, if you kind of look at the, for the therapists out there, the CPT codes, we use unattended Easton when we're applying it and we're leaving. So we're not there. It's unsupervised. And it's a code that we can use. And if you kind of look at the weight of codes in the hospital, we use this APC weight. It's somewhat similar to RVUs, which is outpatient. It kind of, it, it holds its a heavy weight. It's 0.133, I believe, uh, compared to say like a self-care um, home management or a therapeutic activity code, which is roughly around like 0 0.1. 0.4. So you not being there, you, you're, you're building wow. some units. And so it's, it's not like not worthwhile. It's you get productivity and it's helping the patient. So wait a minute, let me, cause again, you're, this is a good for my own edification. Mm -hmm. uh, what is, walk me through what unattended, um, what did you call it? Unattended, unattended e-stem or unattended electrical e stimulation is the code that we use. Okay. So, how, so, so when can you build that? You literally put it on the patient, walk away and come back. That's an unintended defined as an unintended e-stem yep. code. Okay. That code itself is, that a, is that a new code or has that been around? I mean, again, I haven't been in a hospital in over 20 years. So new for me is within yeah. the last 20 years. I can't answer the 20 years, but uh. I, mean, I think it's <laughs> always been around, you know, to us, we're like, no, we can't fill something for not being present. But we, we had people thoroughly look into it and it's that code is, is used for exactly That's what amazing. we're doing. That's great. And it sounds like you can get good reimbursement for that code, which is even more because you mentioned how th compared to Thorax, ADL, stuff like that. So what are the, are you only billing that code for the program, unattended ESTEM code for, what is it, for one hour or how many units? Yeah, unattended ESTEM is a procedural code. So it's just, we just bill one unit or okay. how long they wear it. Um, but ideally, this patient is having OT most days of the week. Um, so we're going to build our regular session. And then if they wear the ESTEM outside of our session, which that's what our protocol call, call, calls for, we'll do our regular, you know, billing and, and then the unattended ESTEM as well. So this is above and beyond. Mm -hmm. So Freighter's real happy about this program, basically, right? You should do an ROI, a return on investment. At some point, it would be good to do that case study next, which is, hey, here's um, the additional incremental revenue earned per patient for their length of stay for the next, let's say, 10 or 20 patients. Because what you're basically saying to administration and, and other therapists listening have to convince their administration how they're not going to be losing money. They're actually going to be uh, making more money because they're maximizing their best practice skills um, is here's the additional revenue build, incremental revenue above and beyond by having this program in place. That would be pretty interesting to kind of understand. So that, that might be a future homework assignment, Jenna. Um, <laughs> so productivity. So that, that's, is there anything that you want to mention about productivity? I guess that's tied to it, right? It's not like it's changing your productivity. Are you, because you're accounting for everything you do. It's not like you're doing extra, but not billing for it. So productivity is not a concern, not an issue, should not be an excuse is what you're saying when it comes to starting this program. Yeah, right? because we're billing, it, it feeds into our productivity. So if we weren't billing, then it's an added step that we have to do, but we're billing for it. So, so it, you know, shows in our productivity. Okay. So we've taken away that excuse. We've taken away the device excuse because there's devices out there that are super easy. One button, get started, no electrode placement issues. You've taken away the excuse that maybe nursing doesn't want to do the program. That's okay. The clinicians are doing it and they're billing for it and it's not affecting their productivity. We've taken away, gee, we're confused about electrode placement. Well, we do know the latest guidelines and, and so you can just wrap it around your deltoids, middle and posterior deltoid if you want. In fact, you could even do anterior. I do anterior a lot. There's still strong 
proximal migrators. You don't have to get funky and try to figure out how am I going to squeeze in super somehow. By the way, super is under your trap. You know, sometimes people are hiking their upper trap. You're not even getting an effective contraction a lot of times with Supra. So again, I got a, th- I got a thing with Supra. I don't know if it's because uh, during my ortho days, I had to do a lot of friction massage on tendonitis patients that had Supra at the insertion site. Something bothers me with Supra, so it's coming back. So so we're taking, we've pretty much taken away all the impediments. Now, um, lessons learned. We're going to be wrapping up in a few minutes here. Lessons learned. What would you do differently? I know this is a question that therapists have already asked pre-podcast. What, is, what would Jenna do differently if she was starting the program from the training to the implementation, time investment, all the things you've done? Anything you do differently and any lessons learned? You know, I thought about this and we currently call the program the shoulder subluxation program, but I feel like we're running into patients who could benefit just because they don't have a shoulder sublux and we've done educating them and, and reinforcing that like, no, we need to get it before they get one because they have muscle weakness. So I don't know if I would change the program to maybe like shoulder Easton program. I'm still debating on this one, but really stressing the beginning of it's not just shoulder subluxation. It's for those who don't have one yet to prevent one to happen. That's a good point. And by the way, what other diagnoses are you currently using this on besides stroke? Mm-hmm. Stroke, uh, brain injury, we will do a brain mass resection. We'll just get a doctor's order that they can use E-STEM. Um, we'll even tie in some spinal cord injuries too. So really, really any neuro, as long as the sublux is less than six months, um, acutely. Right. So this, this is a definitely another topic for another podcast, but let me at least bring it up as we wrap up. Now that you've successfully implemented this program, I guess before I even make this comment, what are your goals now? I mean, uh, are you uh, did you satisfy all your goals or is there other facilities within your network you want to train? I mean, big picture, it's to get like <laughs> worldwide hospitals, rehab facilities, outpatient therapists, just everybody doing this. And I hope that the podcast reaches all, but where I can maybe have a little bit more um, pull is... I want all freighter hospitals. And that's already something in the works. Um, We have two more hospitals that we want to get it going. We're merging with Theta Care up in Appleton, Wisconsin, who's already starting to do the program. So whatever reach I have in our health system, I want this to to get going. But I mean, everybody needs to do it. (laughs) Well, Well, let me close with a rant. Um, a, a small rant because if anyone knows the podcast or listens or watches or excuse me or reads my LinkedIn sometimes contrarian posts, an air, one of the problems that I have with uh, therapists that see neuro patients, which is different than neurotherapists, it, and, and the hospital limitations, and obviously freighter, you know, nothing but applauds uh, uh, and accolades to freighter, right? One of the problems I have is we're trying to quickly get these neuro patients out of the system. And so we teach them one-handed techniques. What we do know, and I won't bore our listeners on this one, they can go listen to other podcasts. I've I've mentioned this in the past, is we know that that contributes to neuronal cell death. If you ignore your area of the brain that's impacted and force them to use their healthy limb, uh, ADLs, grooming, exercise, you're slowly killing brain cells. Basically, you're a neuronal murderer, Jenna. Our, some of these OTs are murderers. They're neuronal murderers. <laughs> yes. So, but the hospitals tell me I got to get them independent uh, as soon as possible, one-handed, out the door. We're neuronal murderers. We need to do more. Now, you just created a template for one specific condition. Why don't we now create another template? Again, small victories here. Why don't we create a program for in room, whether it's visual imagery, mental practice. Let's just take it. Let's just be super, super easy. Mirror box. Let's just start with mirror box, which we know is super powerful. If you want to do mental practice, we can do that too. And let's save that for another conversation. But why can't we just give every new admission a mirror box and, and they're very, you, you guys can make them for like $5. And then there's, there's commercially available ones too, but they're not as cheap. And just give them a mirror box program while they're with you. What's the difference between giving them a subluxation program to preemptively address one condition and not do the same thing to help rewire the brain, prevent neuronal cell death, and try to, while they're in that acute subacute stage, boost the neuroplasticity with easy things they could do in their room. Maybe save it for them at dinner time with their husband or, or their wife. Maybe they're at the level they can do it on their own. Maybe you're already doing that. But let me just say one thing. 
Mirror box could be a program. Mental practice could be a program. You just did Easton. Maybe do Easton for wrist and finger extensors. extensors. That could be a program. Uh, let, let me just pause right there. Do those programs currently exist or is that the same boat we're in with the subluxation program and why we're doing what we're doing now? Oh, you know, I think there's some that are in inpatient rehab, definitely not acutely in the hospital. I try, me personally, I try to especially throw out that graded motor imagery. I'll use later, the laterality apps, a mental practice to, and then tying that mirror box, but it's not a concrete program. You know, you bring up the point of having patients do more outside of therapy because there's so much downtime. They're just sitting around and I feel like the family, the patient, they feel out of control. And if we can just give them a couple homework things to work on, it's going to help with the neuroplasticity, but then it's going to feel like make them more empowered too. So I love this idea. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, it is the, the analogy I always give. And again, healthcare, I'm not blaming a specific hospital. I'm blaming our healthcare system and reimbursement system. Think of elite athletes. How often do you need to practice? And by the way, elite athletes rewire their brain. It's, it's neuroplasticity. It doesn't matter what it is. If I want to learn Chinese tomorrow, it's neuroplasticity. If I want to learn how to throw a football and play a sport, it's neuroplasticity. Of course, there's positive and negative. If, if I see a drive-by shooting, I'm going to have PTSD. That's negative neuroplasticity. So we, we, our brain changes based on the owner's behavior. So it's, no matter what I do, that's going to negatively or positively you know, cause neuroplasticity. So if you're an elite athlete, how many hours a day are you training for that sport, Division I professional? Hours and hours on a daily basis, okay? That's to, be, that's to maximize your uh, potential through rewiring because you got to put the reps in. What are we telling our brain-injured patients to do? Because the way I, I approach my patients, I say, look, you're an athlete. We got to train like an athlete if we want progress. If you're not training like an athlete, don't expect progress. Training like an athlete requires hours per day. Well, what does our health healthcare system do? Are they really setting these patients up for success? Well, let's let's one, two, I'm I'm counting on my hand. When they're yes, they do get their three hours of total care in a hospital setting. That's one hour of speech, one hour of PT, one hour. So my arm is getting one hour, maybe, but then I'm getting discharged eventually. And then I'm gonna be going home where I'm gonna get three times per week, maybe, of home care or outpatient for one hour. Then I'm supposed to be doing something at home that might be good or it might not be good. I am nowhere near training like an elite athlete to make the progress I need. So why on earth, if we expect athletes to do this, why on earth are we not doing that for patients who have brain injuries that need more than that? And then we wonder why these patients aren't getting better. Mm -hmm. So not looking for an answer. That's just me ranting. But you know what we can do by fighting the system is doing what you just did with the subluxation program, right? That's one notch on your belt. Congratulations. And, and now the next step is don't stop there. Mm-hmm. It's very, now that you have the blueprint, do that visual imagery, do that mental practice, do that, you know, East him in the room for wrist and fingers, do something else because you're not, these patients have to train like athletes. So hopefully you can squeeze that in, plus be a wonderful mother of two, plus be a wonderful wife and do all the other wonderful things you do. We just need more of Jenna's. That's what we need. <laughs> no comment for that one, right? All right. Well, Jenna, listen, it's it's already been an hour. I could keep going. Thank you so much for this wonderful uh, Q&A podcast. Hopefully, some of the clinicians found this helpful. I know I have. How can folks find you if they want to learn more and dive deep? Can they actually reach out oh, to you? Oh, most definitely. Um, I, I'm on LinkedIn. My real name is Jennifer. So you could just look me up on Jennifer Barber. Um, but then also shoot me an email. I don't know if Henry can kind of put it in there. Um, but it's jennifer.barber um, at freighter.com. So I would love to help, you know, get this started for you. I'm a clinician at heart. I want to help people and I don't care if you work at Freighter or not. I, I want everybody to have help. So please reach out. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks so much. I'll definitely add your contact details. Um, and I really appreciate your time today. And um, we'll have to continue this discussion and do maybe another podcast in six months on another program. Right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Jen. It was great talking right, to you today. See ya. Thank you. And guys, thank you so much for tuning in. Um, if you have any questions, of course, you can ping me, direct message me. And of course, if you have some for Jenna, I will forward those on to her as well. And I'll put her email and contact information in. Thanks again for watching and listening to the No Plateau podcast. Take care. 
Thank you for tuning in to the No Plateau podcast. Please make sure to like and subscribe to stay up to date on more stroke and brain injury recovery stories. The No Plateau podcast is intended to give you an insight into stroke and brain injury survivors' journeys. Any opinions given on this podcast are strictly the individual's, and we do not suggest that you necessarily hold the same viewpoints as anyone on this podcast. This podcast is intended to supplement stroke and brain injury survivors' recovery journey. Therefore, all content affiliated with this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health providers with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Reliance on any information provided by the No Plateau podcast is solely at your own risk.